And I just want to welcome all of y'all to Reams Creek Nursery in our warm season vegetable gardening class with Lisa Wagner. Thanks to all of y'all for attending on this rainy morning. Hope you have a nice cup of coffee or tea. And um, I know this talk is going to get y'all fired up about planting some vegetables very soon. We are going to have by the, about the middle of the week a lot of tomatoes and peppers out on our tables and our cool season vegetables are now half price. So during the talk, we are going to keep everyone on mute, but if you have a question, please put it in the chat and I'll be kind of monitoring the chat. If it's a question that can maybe wait till the end, I'll let it wait. But if it seems really pertinent, I'm gonna try to jump in and, and ask Lisa. So, um, if you'll bear with me just a minute, I'd like to introduce you to Lisa Wagner and tell you a little bit about our speaker. Lisa has served on as the Director of Education at the South Carolina Botanical Garden at Clemson University for over 20 years. A plant ecologist by background, she's also a gardener, a naturalist, a writer, a blogger, and an educator, and she's very generous with educating people. She does frequent presentations and classes on a variety of topics, including native plants for pollinators, gardening for nature, hands-on perennials, and four-season vegetable garden gardening. And I know last year she um, also did a wonderful pocket meadow class for Reams Creek Nursery. Lisa also does landscape consultations to benefit programs at nonprofits in the Carolinas, especially gardens. Her blog, Natural Gardening, reflects her gardening and nature experiences over the last decade. You can access her blog at lisakwagner.com. Thanks so much for being with us this morning, Lisa. Thank you, Ruth. And what a wonderful rainy Saturday to be thinking about our warm season vegetables. And I can see a subset of you um, on the gallery view right now. If, if you have grown vegetables for longer than five years, can you raise your hand? If you're a newbie, raise your hand. Well, no, new, no total new, little newbies. Okay, well, Growing vegetables is such a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Um, the, the deliciousness of vegetables that you grow yourself from special varieties is really um, extraordinary. And the, I've been growing vegetables now for, I don't know, 25 years or so, um, at least successfully. I did so unsuccessfully long ago, but um, with that said, I shall now start my presentation. And um, as Ruth said, if you do have a question, just write it in the chat, she'll be able to see it and either that or I'll answer questions at the end. I will mention too, on my, the side of my blog, I have a PDF file on, um, and I'll sh of this, of a, a year round gardening presentation and of a handout that I usually use for, growing vegetables all year round. But today we're going to focus on warm season vegetables. And those are the ones that we hope that all of you have sat on your hands and not put out in the ground yet, the peppers and tomatoes and eggplants. It looks like after Sunday night that we're going to be in good shape with settled days, warmer temperatures during the day, and it's not so cold at night. Um, for our warm season veggies. And, and Ruth mentioned that the Reams Creek will have these coming out of the greenhouses, the peppers and tomatoes and eggplants, and then later some of the other things to grow from seed. So warm season vegetable gardening here in the uh, Southeast is kind of always a dance. Um, it's we thrive with these to the tomatoes, peppers, and beans, and eggplants, whereas other parts of the world may have to do extra help to be able to grow these, these things. But this is the time of the year uh, here at the end of April. Um, oops, let me 
is secure. Uh, that we start thinking about planting out these plants. There's nothing new, of course, about growing vegetables and the, the, there are many wonderful guides. Growing vegetables hasn't really gone out of, uh, doesn't change particularly in what we do. They, uh, you know, we, we, I think we've turned to be more organic in recent years. We tend to use more raised beds than we used to. Um, I, I started out talking about vegetable gardening in a very ornamental fashion, talking about urban, attractive vegetable gardens. Um, but lots of great resources out there for you to consult and try. I was mentioning to Ruth before starting this presentation, I just read in the Citizen Times, a book review of a new book that's coming out at, called The Chef's Table. And this fellow is a, who wrote it was a vegetable gardener who's using and promoting all sorts of uncommon vegetables as well as eating parts of vegetables we don't normally eat anymore like carrot tops, which I thought was very unusual. Now we, uh, we used to be here in the mountains in zone 6B, we're now in zone seven, but it's all dependent on where you are in elevation. If you're in the Asheville Basin, like I am, it's a little bit of a urban heat island effect. That would be one thing. If you're a thousand feet higher out in Weaverville, up Reams Creek, that's a whole nother ball game. If you're even higher, again, that's a different sort of thing. We look at our average last frost mid to late April, as you know, as you all know, a few days ago, it got pretty darn, it was pretty darn nippy and you're, Tomatoes would not have been happy campers out there. Um, and it can really knock them back uh, too if they were outside. We can grow warm season plants and then our fall garden crops too through uh, the average first frost in late October. Um, so pay attention, you can go onto the USDA zone maps and find exactly where you are and figure out what your situation is. And of course, every year is, is slightly different. You just never know. We always have to consider where we're trying to grow vegetables. And if you've lived in the same place for a really long time, that place you always grew them before may actually have changed. It may be shaded out now, or it may have more roots in it. And we're looking for our warm season vegetables for at least six to eight hours of sun. You can fudge that a little bit if you have afternoon sun, um, not, but in, let in put up with a little bit less productivity. But for our, for our fruit producing vegetables, you know, the squash, tomatoes, peppers, they just will not thrive in, in shady conditions. In contrast, just as an aside, the cool season leafy greens, lettuces and things like that do, do reason, even beets do reasonably well in shade. So we wanna also know what that soil is like then. Um, this was the, my very first bed back in the Piedmont 25 years ago, which I had carved out from undisturbed lawn. Our house had been there since 1926, so this lawn had been there a long time. So when I dug up this patch, it was actually pretty good soil, a bit clayey, but I could dig in. It looks like I put some sort of leafy stuff on top um, there and was happily growing, it looks like snow peas and some onions and some greens. You want to pay attention to those surrounding trees and shrubs. Consider that wind exposure as well as sun. What's that soil, how organic um, or rich in organic matter the soil is, and what the pH is. Some of our vegetables like beets and spinach are very sensitive to acidic soils and just won't thrive unless they you add some lime to them. And it's, I'm not, it, you, Fortunately, in North Carolina, you can easily have a soil test. In the winter, it's free. I think in the summer, they're now charging a, a modest fee. It's not that critical, but the pH is really important to know. And our soils here in Western North Carolina, depending on if, I don't think I included a soil map in this 
presentation, but it is it was remarkable to me to to as I started talking uh, about this to look at that and it's worth and you know what your soil is like and it may be different than your neighbors you know your little pocket whether your soil was scraped off by a builder um, whether your house has been there a long time whether it was like you had a, you have a lot of lawn like this where the soil is probably in pretty good shape um, if it's been there for a while. Um, I used to joke down in the Piedmont that all of our topsoil was in Charleston Harbor and we were left with subsoil. And we're not too far from that here either in some situations. Logging at the end of uh, the 19th century and early 20th century caused a lot of erosion. In some cases, and topsoil replenishes itself pretty darn slowly. And it, de it depends a lot on what where you are in this general area. So uh, that, that's something to, to know about. That said, I, I, uh, I'm a big fan of raised beds and they make it simple. These beds that um, my husband Tim and I built in front of our um, house in Asheville, um, we filled with commercial compost where it had been a, uh, created uh, for a mulch yard, a local mulch yard by commercial composting with vegetables from the big Western North Carolina farmers market. This stuff was incredibly rich and friable. And I thought I was an experienced vegetable gardener at this point, but I could not believe how robust this pure compost was uh, in growing beets, I think these are, you know, beets and vegetables and things that I had really struggled with growing them in raised beds in the ground. Um, you can see here, this is a mid-May image that I'd already put in. I must have really pushed the envelope there on the tomatoes while I'm still growing leafy greens. And so the way that I, I do vegetables when I'm here year round is I'm, it's a, it's a year round process. And if we've had a hard winter, which has been infrequent, I might start with a blank slate. Otherwise I'm tucking in warm season as I'm harvesting cool season. So, so raised beds are certainly easier to manage. You never step on the soil, so it's never compacted. You can loosen it up. They're easy to amend and add more to. And you can see here, we're, we're in, this is, our house is an infill house. This is a hundred year old apartment building next to us. Um, so, so there was a premium on making it a particularly cute um, raised bed garden. But um, here in my Piedmont garden, I used, Fieldstone to demarcate the blocks and sort of a loose square foot gardening pattern. And I'm not a, I like to have my garden, my vegetable garden look attractive. I'm not an engineer type person with rows and precise. I like to mix things up. You can see my lettuces and kale and there along with a trellis. Um, and that, it, you can suit yourself. It depends on what you want to look at. I like to grow uh, vegetables in containers too. These are fairly small examples, herbs, uh, nasturtiums, which have edible flowers and leaves, carrots. I have often grown tomatoes and eggplant and peppers in larger containers. It makes a nice alternative, um, especially if you have any issues with your, your soil and you can keep the, the, the potting mix can be, well, if it's well drained and high quality, um, is really can be very, very good for vegetables. Another view of these same beds. I'll make a point with raised raised beds. Ten to twelve inches is good. It doesn't need to be more than that. Underneath here is gravel. It's not like these things are rooting down into the, the soil. This bed where I grow tend to grow tomatoes is deeper, but it's not totally necessary either. I've grown tomatoes in those shower beds as well. Um, I like to grow a lot of things vertically. I have less space here than I have had in other gardens. Um, so growing pole beans rather than bush beans, growing sugar snap peas and snow peas that are grow up and are less dwarf is also a good 
has been served me well. Um, if you have more space um, and you don't mind, you know, bending over to harvest things, I've noticed that as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm less likely to want to be bending over and harvesting things. But um, so having trellises or is another was is another boon. I like to grow herbs and I, uh, in my beds as well. This was a particularly lush lavender year, it looks like. Um, and the way that we choose vegetables and grow our vegetables, I like to really encourage people to keep it sustainable, make it fun. Don't go and plant a whole bunch of stuff. Then you feel like, oh my God, I've got to harvest way more than, then wait, I don't even like this vegetable anyway. Who can I give it to? Um, grow what you and your family like to eat or what you can give away to your friends or to the, the food bank. Um, I like to encourage people to start small. Um, and if, you've, if you have a way big vegetable garden, you don't always have to have a way big vegetable garden. Um, it, and it, it's always helpful to focus on vegetables that are easy to grow. I like to always add some new things each year if I can. Um, but I don't really, you know, some things are easier to grow than others. I personally have found carrots extremely difficult here in, to grow in the South. Nationwide on veg, easy vegetables to grow lists, you'll see, oh yes, carrots, let, you know, always on this list, well, or radishes. Well, for us, depending on the spring to summer season, those carrots and radishes can really get bitter or spicy quite rapidly if the heat comes in quickly. And to grow big, succulent, juicy carrots, you need coolish weather and you certainly aren't gonna be growing them as a warm season vegetable. Um, deep soils, and, and I'm, just, I'm just mentioning that because it, it's, uh, it's worth keeping in mind. I have a friend who now lives in Costa Rica who grows vegetables on organic volcanic soil. He posted on Facebook a picture of a carrot that must have been about this big. I mean, it was just huge. Big, you know. So he had the right climate for that. Now, the nice thing about having nurseries like Reams Creek around is that you know that they're growing varieties that are going to do well in our, our area. Um, the, that's not true of our big box stores necessarily, or the Bonnie's plants that are coming from Alabama, or, you know, they could be in, I mean, I'm just saying that it's nice also that we have local tailgate markets, the big Western North Carolina herb festival is coming up um, next weekend. They'll have a lot of vegetable starts there too. I look for disease and pest resistant varieties I, I do like to grow heirlooms. I always wanna grow something that's tasty. Um, so I'm looking for cultivars that you know, are really, that are bred for their taste, not necessarily for shipping from California to the East Coast. And some of, there's a dramatic difference between some of the cultivars that you, get, you can grow yourself from seed or buy transplants of versus what you buy at the, at the grocery in terms of their taste and certainly freshness. So try something new I, too. That, that's always a lot of fun each, each year. One of mine a few a decade or so ago was yard long beans. I, I'd seen some in Asian markets. I thought, oh, they're related to our field peas or cow peas and they grow on trellises and they do really well in warm weather. I thought, well, that's a nice alternative to pole, some of our pole beans, which if it gets really hot, will stop um, producing flowers or will stop, uh, they won't, will stop producing fruits as will tomatoes in too hot a weather. We have lots of wonderful seed um, catalogs out there now. The boom in, in veg renewed interest in vegetable gardening over the last decade plus has really the variety of seeds that are available. 
I love botanical interests um, and Territorial, which is a West Coast company. Southern Exposure Seed Exchange is, sort, is a Seed Savers Alliance. They're for unusual things. It's, it's a, a great source. Um, someone told me at a re re recent program that Johnny's is not selling seeds to the public this year, but normally they, uh, because of the demand, but normally they're, they, they're a well-known seed house, lots and lots of great seed companies. So, and I, I love to share this, <laughs> this photograph. Um, back when I taught classes down at the botanical garden in person, I had a, I had a reason I could buy all these seeds because then I could share them with the folks in my classes. I, I no longer have that um, opportunity, so I can't really justify buying all these seeds anymore. Um, but it's, it was so much fun. And I loved getting seeds from Italy, from Renee's uh, garden here, imports a lot of seeds from the Netherlands and France that are very delicious cultivars and, you know, thing. And here's a, a seed savers exchange, tennis ball lettuce. That was Thomas Jefferson's favorite lettuce at Monticello because each little, head of lettuce, it's a, it's a butter lettuce variety, it was just so delicious. He, he was a huge plant-centric eater way before people were plant-centric. So um, he, he even grew sesames, a sesame uh, plants to get the sesame seed oil to put on his salads, if you can imagine such a thing. It, which I, I just love that. And if you have a chance to visit Monticello um, during the growing season, the restored vegetable gardens are just totally amazing to, to see. A lot of unusual older vegetables like sea kale too, you can see. So we're looking here at the these warm season vegetables. You can see how I might have done a rotation from cool to warm. So we're looking at cucumbers, beans, tomatoes, peppers, squash. Here I've got trombocino squash going on a fence. You can see I've got another sort of trellis here, the A, these wooden trellises. Lots of options for plant supports. They can be purchased at, at places like Reams Creek or at, at from um, mail or online suppliers like Gardener Supply, which I in up in Vermont, which I'm a big fan of. Um, and they make a good alternative. If you're handy with, with bamboo and want to mess around with that, there's lots of bamboo available out there to make trellis supports as well. Um, so we've got, so in this, this is potatoes, garlic that are going to be harvested probably in early June and beans starting to grow up. And so, you can see just a sequence here. I was in summer in my Piedmont garden. Early summer was a, bit, a jumble of, of beans and a um, few, few flowers. I like to mix up flowers in my vegetable plots just to make them pretty. Spring look like this with my two sets of trellises. Here's, here are yard long beans and they, that grow well into the fall as do other beans and very, very productive. I actually really like yard long beans, but I did have a um, someone in my class one time who, who this has been quite a while ago, who actually did, she told me later, she was in a different class of, you know, my family and I didn't really like those yard long beans, but so all of our tastes differ, but I thought they were great. They were easy to pick. You just chop them up and, um, they don't taste exactly like green beans, but they're delicious to me. So. so we're planting now late April and May when the, the temperatures have become settled. We have temperatures well above 50 at, at night or at least above 50 at night. I have, you can measure soil temperatures as a, as a check on your wanting to plant those tomatoes early. I have a friend who uses these things called wall of water for her tomatoes and peppers um, to get a head start. We have such a long growing season to grow tomatoes and peppers. Uh, it hasn't ever seemed to me to be important to push the envelope too far early with that. Um, Historically, people would talk about planting warm season vegetables around Mother's Day. And 
when you look at our predictions for next week, we're in good shape after Sunday night um, for decent warmth for our warm season things. We're growing these plants through July, uh, June, July, August, often through September, hope for some decent rain in September, it's not too dry. And by that time, you're also sowing you some false things at the end of August and early September, sometimes into October if you're going to carry them over. Now this seed chart came from uh, Gardener's Supply and it illustrates vegetable seed germination temperatures. And here are some things that we put out for our summer. summer. And you can see there was a difference between sort of a practical temperature for planting and optimal temperatures for germination. And so the, the interaction between the seed, for the soil temperatures and seed germination and how fast those seeds will germinate um, it's important to pay attention to. I have sugar snap peas coming up now. They're probably eight inches tall. Um, it, it's kind of a race. Are they going to be able to produce those peas before it gets hot? Who knows? But I didn't want to plant them too early. Similarly, cucumbers, cantaloupe, and squash, and beans, and watermelon, and okra, we tend, we generally we plant those from seed. Occasionally, you, you you can try, you can find them with from transplants, um, although that I think generally the idea is they do better if they don't, aren't transplanted. But you can see that you're really waiting for, for warmer temperatures here to plant those. Uh, corn isn't, oh, I guess corn is on it. And I was actually surprised to see that it'll germinate fairly, fairly cool temperature, but it really would like warmer temperatures. Again, here was this mid-May bed that I showed you before. Some, I've mentioned a number of our, our warm season vegetables. Some others to mention would be tomatillas, okra, Swiss chard is one of the few leafy greens that does well in warm temperatures. Um, most of the others will don't, don't do well at all. Um, Winter squash, summer squash, all do fantastic. Field peas, cow peas um, are good summer, summer crops, although they take a lot of space. I, I, I haven't grown them myself, but I, where I volunteered at the Southside Community Garden for several years, we had a huge row of them and they were very, very productive. And I'll mention basil as one, one herb that thrives in warm, weather and it needs warm weather. If they had been out with that cold, um, with a frost this last week, they would be blackened at this point. Um, they, and there are some herbs like we would think about cilantro to grow and to make salsa with, with tomatoes. Cilantro wants to bolt really quickly, that is flower and produce seeds. So what you can do is do successive planting of of cilantro every two weeks to, to keep ahead of that flowering proclivity. These are some Cherokee purple tomatoes I grew one year um, that were absolutely wonderful and delicious. Um, huge plants, not as productive as some tomatoes, but really there's some really wonderfully um, different tomatoes to try growing. You know, we've had, some of you may get this, there's a, a catalog that I get that's nothing but tomato, tomato um, seeds and tomato plants. And if you happen, if you don't wanna to try to grow your own very specific transplants, you can actually, in, in increasingly nurseries like Reams Creek and other sources, you can find some unusual varieties or different varieties, but um, you can also order online and get plants sent to you if you have something you really want in particular. Beef steak, cherry tomatoes, salad tomatoes, paste tomatoes, grape tomatoes, you know, patio tomatoes, yellow ones, purple ones, orange ones, you know, you can have open pollinated, dis hybrid disease resistant varieties, lots of heirlooms out there. Um, the, the best tomatoes, I grew some San Marzano paste tomatoes one year 
which were really great because they're very thick walled. And uh, we were lucky enough to visit the home of San Marzano, which is on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius one time. And that's, they grow really well there in the, the volcanic soil in Italy. And you can overdo growing tomatoes. Um, there's just me and my husband. Um, this was in the end of July, 2012. I, it says, I, uh, I'm noting that this was today's harvest, yikes. But you'll see the diversity of tomatoes I did have. And I'll just make a, a, a note. We have a small chest freezer and I have kind of a, rule as a, a vegetable gardener is that we've eaten everything in our chest freezer before, you know, before the beginning of the warm season um, uh, vegetable onslaught. And tr I try to try to moderate that. It's I roast tomatoes and freeze them and that's a, um, a, an easy way to do it I, in containers or in um, or in glass jars or whatever. Uh, I don't personally can, but I know lots of people that do. Peppers are equally diverse and you, um, hot peppers and sweet peppers, um, roasting peppers, cherry peppers. These are my very favorite variety of peppers to grow in the Southeast. These, they're called pizza peppers and they're, they're very thick walled, relatively small. I got the original seed from Territorial. Um, but the reason I like them is because they are thick walled, they're not spicy, and, and they are very successful in warm season um, gardens. Peppers are, are good for us, but if you're wanting to grow something that looks like a hothouse pepper here in, in your own garden, you're gonna to have to be a better gardener than I am because I have not ever had any good luck with that. When I grow anything that's remotely like a traditional bell pepper and perhaps um, Ruth has a better, has, can share some my thoughts about that, is that they're always very thin, the walls are thinner, maybe I'm not watering them enough um, or not fertilizing them enough, but I like to grow peppers that will thrive in, in our occasionally warm, summer days. I already mentioned I like to grow beans on trellises because of the height uh, and there's so many different kinds of pole beans to to grow from filet beans that are like French filet beans, Romano beans, purple pole beans, um, the yard long beans I already mentioned, um, yellow wax beans, just lots and lots of possibilities. Both the, of these sorts of trellises are easy to use. Um, the, there are lots of colorful versions available and more decorative versions too. So um, beans, beans require picking on a daily basis. You can't go and forget, go off and vacation in early August unless you begged your neighbors to harvest beans. But, or you're prepared to let them catch up after you come back and then you harvest, um, harvest them so they'll go be small again. Um, that's a, or you just eat the seed or eat the seeds as fresh beans and not the, the pods. I, I wanted to just share, this was a trellis I made out of some barn, uh, out of some old uh, fence poles up in Quebec where we are in normal, times in the summer, and that's a totally different vegetable gardening season, but these were scarlet runner beans that I had growing and they, they produced these beautiful flowers and actually even produced a few edible beans by the end of the summer, but very simple three pole trellis there. You'll notice there's nasturtiums growing in the summer, ha. Huh. So here's some, I had a, this was a bean harvest, all these yard long beans. I had Romano beans, some looks like some half runner beans, which are really good Southern Appalachian uh, versions. They're greasy beans too, that are delicious. Um, I like to not overdo beans because then I have so many beans, I don't know what to do with them. And then you have to feel like, oh no, I have to freeze them or blanch them or, do something with them. So again, keep it small and grow what you know that you and your family can eat or you can 
palm off on your friends. I love growing these Asian eggplants, the long skinny ones, they're Japanese varieties. Sometimes, usually they're purple or dark, darker purple than this one. Occasionally you'll run across a white variety. Uh, the big um, globe Italian eggplants, you can grow well here too. Um, I've had a lot of success growing them in pots. Here's, a, here's that a relatively small pot with a really nice large eggplant plant in it that's being really productive. And by my standards, having four eggplants is plenty of eggplants for one harvest. Um, here's an eggplant in the, in the raised bed that in one of those years, also very productive. Um, they like the heat um, and it, if you like eggplant, I certainly would encourage you to grow them. Um, you can see here where I'm, I'm really packing plants in and probably pushing them closer than what you might see as spacing, partially because I don't really care about having humongous productivity. I want to have something delicious to harvest that I will cook and we can eat and enjoy. Um, you know, I don't necessarily need a gazillion tomatoes or a gazillion eggplant plants or lots and lots of beans. But um, I do know people that have much larger gardens who grow deliberately, you know, and with to share with their local food banks or food pantries. And that's certainly a, an admirable thing to do. Now, squash, we can grow summer and winter squashes. Um, and the typical joke about summer squash and zucchini is that we're sneaking in onto your neighbor's porch to leave them the pile of squash that you've had dripping from your plants. Um, well, depending on where you are and whether you have people that are who, who have been growing summer squash in their gardens nearby, you may not be getting any summer squash because of squash vine borers. At the moths that uh, lay their eggs in squash vines emerge generally in late May, early June. And just about the time your zucchini and yellow squashes start flowering is when these moths come and lay their eggs. And then the vines will, at least in my experience, the vines collapse just about the time you want to have a zucchini. So I've never had much success growing summer squash or zucchini, partially because I don't want to cover them and hand pollinate the flowers. Um, you can try planting early or planting late and avoiding the squash vine borers, but my um, that's one possibility, or I'll show you some row covers. I had a friend actually who injected BT into the, her vines and you can try to also ex excavate the, the little caterpillars out of the vines. I personally never had much luck with that, but um, always worth trying. Um, but what I've loved is it all, on, as an alternative is eating winter squash as young green squash. These baby butternuts that I'm, they have in this image the mature size squashes are small, they're about a pound, but these immature miniature butternuts, you can just slice up and eat green and they are so delicious. They have a faint butternut squash taste, a, a fantastic texture, and even better, this, the species of winter squash, Cucurita moscata, Though there were, those vines are resistant to the squash vine borers, so you can grow these successfully here. And I've done that now for five or six years since these small ones were um, introduced. Um, occasionally, when I have been able to avoid the squash vine borers, you, when you can grow patty pans, or one year I actually grew little gourd-like squashes that were very resistant, it can be... Fresh squash is really absolutely delicious. There's another uh, winter squash that people um, grow as an alternative. This is a trombocino squash. You can see here on this trellis was very happy this year. Um, 
Again, resistant. This is an Italian um, variety of, of a winter squash eaten as a green squash. Here's a very young fruit. Um, generally, I would harvest them a little bit smaller, the, I mean, a bit, little bit larger. They have a mild flavor. They don't taste exactly like zucchini. They, they're, they're really not, they're really pretty pleasant. Um, um, and I've, I've enjoyed those and it's a lot more fun not to have this, the vines collapse. They do sometimes get powdery mildew and that I will pull them out at that point. So trombocino squash, it's also has an Italian name that's sort of like means something like coiled lizard tail or something. It's, um, you'll run across it like name with those sorts of names too. I always like to add herbs, as I've mentioned earlier, thyme. Here's some parsley going to seed. Parsley is a biennial. Um, um, I always try to look for varieties of thyme that are really tasty, ditto with oregano or marjoram or sage. Like sometimes they're, they're more ornamental, particularly with rosemary, I like to look for, and I had a, just a wonderful variety one time that had very thick, broad, almost, I wouldn't call them succulent leaves, but they weren't like many of the varieties that we grow more as an ornamental, but they were delicious to use in dishes. And I lost it to a frost, a really hard freeze one winter. And I haven't ever really found that again, but the closest is really a, the trailing um, rosemaries, just looking for ones that have flatter, softer leaves is, is a good clue for a good rosemary to use in cooking. Now, I have a native plant background, and as a vegetable gardener, I've really had a, an uphill battle to, convince, to make myself realize vegetables are pampered, domesticated plants. They need lots and lots of nutrients. They need organic matter. We're harvesting them uh, all summer long. Sometimes they're working all year round um, with, if you're growing cool season vegetables too. And this image from years ago strikes me as a paltry amount of compost that I must, I was adding to these beds. Optimally, every time I would prepare a bed like this, I would have at least two inches of composted chicken manure, cow manure, um, if you can get real mushroom compost, mushroom compost, or your own compost if you happen to create a lot of it, which is a little bit of a challenge. Um, the, so abundant nutrients, using products to replenish each bed. This was a year that I, sort of interesting, it looks like I just pulled out squash plants and I guess I was re, um, re amending this, so this bed to plant some new things. It's, it looks like I have some basil in there that I left. Um, the products that, so composted manure, um, uh, manures of varying sorts are, are good. And if you happen to have uh, the ability to go to a mulch yard and get smaller quantities, I certainly would do that. Um, I don't have a, a pickup, so I, don't do that, but um, there, there's plenty of good sources. And I would say I would avoid the, the big box versions of these things because they aren't always what they're labeled to be. There's mushroom compost is notorious for not ever having seen a mushroom in, real, in reality. So, I like to use sustained release organic fertilizers myself. I'm, I'm a, a pretty much totally organic gardener, um, especially for vegetables. And these are, I would say relatively equivalent when you actually look at the nutrient breakdowns, they're not, you know, if, if you don't have any garden tone or tomato tone, uh, you can go ahead and use something else, regular, um, Organic sustained release are a good idea. I, um, I, fish fertilizer is great stuff, but when you have furry fellows out there and it's not deodorized, it's not a good idea, um, at least in my experience. Um, I will mention uh, 
this composted product. You may have seen trucks of this. This is from down somewhere in Hendersonville from a super sod farm where they're doing commercial composting in rows and we'll sell these big bags. And th this stuff is really, I was lucky enough to get a free bag of this stuff one year as was my friend because we were both members of Garden Riders. And it, it was really impressive stuff, um, but very pricey. But I will make an unashamed plug since they gave me a bag of it and it was good. Now, a few, a few uh, uh, mentions of pests. My primary pests are the critters that crawl out of the woods. This was Woodchuck who came and thought, oh, she's growing collards for me, Chump, you know, munched on them. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to put out these hoops and cover them over to prevent the woodchucks. Um, you may have deer, you may have rabbits, um, other kinds of pests that we, get our aphids, which you can usually control with insecticidal soaps or just with spray, spraying water on them. Um, sometimes squirrels can be a problem in some beds, uh, some places, um, chewing on tomatoes. And, and you almost always start thinking about barriers as the main uh, way to keep herbivore pests away from your plants. Um, the, the repellents can work, but then you've got to deal with applying them all the time and whether you wanna apply them to something you're going to eat later is an, another question. I've started to use in recent years, these wire, chicken wire cloches that are I get, I purchased from Gardener Supply and they come in different sizes and sh um, shapes. There's a, a hoop style one that you can have higher. And depending on what crops you're growing, these can be really effective. They also do, do double duty to support um, ro row covers and reme in, in, to protect against uh, frost in, in the winter time. So that was is sort of handy, but it, it's, we have cats in our neighborhood. The, the young people that live in the apartment next door tend to let their cats wander around. And I got really tired of the cats using my beds as a litter box. And so that was also a way to keep the cats out. Um, now, I have a real premium on having my beds look what, I, what I'm considering attractive. You can imagine I'm pulling my car up and I look at my raised beds every time I come into the, the house. But having reme or floating row covers like this is a good way to deter any sort of insect pests or uh, herbivore pests. Um, you just have to uncover these if you wanna have, uh, access for pollination for squash or, or beans or anything that needs cross-pollination to set fruit. So I'll mention those, they're wild, widely avail, available, um, uh, especially at local farm supply stores. I probably, Reams Creek has availability too. Um, I like to promote designated beds for vegetables. This was our demonstration vegetable garden at the Botanical Garden down in Clemson. It was surrounded by brick walls. It's right next to the visitor center. And it was extremely productive um, because of the soil. And our horticultural staff member that worked with this did, did till these these beds, but they were designated and you didn't step on them after the plants were grown. And you'll notice here's a great big squash plant. And it's a good example of the sort of garden that was all by itself. There were no other vegetable gardens close by to where this was. This is up on a hill. The South Carolina Botanical Garden is really big. It's 300 acres. And so it was really far from any other garden so the squash vine borers wouldn't find the squash which is really nice. Um, woodchucks found it though so they crept out of somewhere and I will say here we just before I left the garden and we moved up to Asheville full-time um, 
Kathy took out these trees because they were starting to shade the, the vegetable garden and cause uh, a little bit lack of productivity on that side. So, and she did a really good job of rotation. We used, my office was quite nearby here, kind of in the carriage house behind. And I'd encourage them to do, so we would do the demonstration all year round. And um, you can see we were growing yard long beans here with that, that year. And we tried to rotate the beds. Um, you, and the, the, the idea of rotation is you're not growing tomatoes in the same place each year or squash in the same place each year or beans in the same place each year because of soil issues and pest buildup. In practice, many of us don't have large enough gardens to do this or um, effectively. So you do your best. You try to maintain soil health, um, use resistant varieties, um, rotate as you can, maybe use an in-between crop like um, garlic or leeks, sort of a cover crop substitute to sort of break that cycle one, one summer. Um, uh, something to think about as you, you're working and, and then paying attention to what sort of issues you have uh, in your, your garden, whether you do have some wilts or um, other issues that tend to, to affect, particularly tomatoes, which are prone to all sorts of things. Um, I, I have, I'm really looking forward to growing okra again this summer, depending if I'm here again. Um, but okra, I always thought I didn't like until we grew it in Southside. And I realized when you harvest it really small and this red heirloom okra, when you roasted it, it is just delicious. And many of you probably love um, okra. Ruth was saying she liked the, the, the texture of okra. Lots of people love fried okra. Um, and it's just a beautiful plant. Um, so a friend of mine from Alabama sent me some really, a really beautiful, she said it was a great bushy okra. And my plan to, is to plant some here in the, the raised beds, hoping we're gonna be going to Canada, but and it'll be pretty regardless. But of course here we'll have okra to roast, I guess. So finally, I'll, uh, we have a number of community gardens in, in this area, um, both growing food for local food banks or to, as places to share. This was a community hoop house in West Asheville that was um, on, on, I think, a Master Gardener's garden tour uh, one season. And you can see how it had sides that rolled up. So they were able to, as the war weather warmed, they were able to provide um, ventilation. So it didn't get too hot in there. They had had a combination of warm season vegetables planted in the in the middle with still some cool season on the outside and then they would um, replace later. Um, so it's really a, um, an interesting an interesting method here and the if you have the opportunity I would really um, take a look at some of the, the um, the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy has a farm out towards, where is it? It's a wonderful old farm that has great hoop houses. If you ever have an opportunity to go to a program um, that you can do it, can go through them. It's really inspiring to see what people do in hoop houses, the, <clears throat> the um, Lisa, I think that's in Alexander, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's right. And then if you have an opportunity, I haven't seen anything about it this year. Um, it was canceled last year, but the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association has a great farm tour um, in this, usually in early summer, and often you'll see some really wonderful examples. I mean, I personally will probably never have a hoop house, but it's, it's fun to, to see what's happening in them, often training tomatoes up in a very uh, elaborate way. Um, so that's the, fine, the end of the, the presentation and uh, the, in 
certainly I'd be glad to <clears throat> answer any questions. I will mention my, my blog is called Natural Gardening, as Ruth said, and I'm going to show you just briefly through the garden sharing. It looks different now than because I had to change templates. And if you want to get to those handouts, depending on whether you're on a desktop or a device, you would go in, you'd see this, which is, this is by a pollinator pocket meadow in our front garden. You click there and you can go down. And here was the year round vegetable gardening presentation, which is very similar to the one I just did, but a bit more about season extension. And this is a, a handout about sustainable kitchen gardening, sustainable vegetable gardening, that you can download both of those. Um, and if you, wanted to um, search, for instance, I'll just say, because I've been writing, doing this so long, um, I have lots of posts about different things. Um, here, you know, I, yard long beans, I are some multiple posts. Here are some yard long beans in, um, in Cartagena, Colombia. Here's some more veg, you know. So anyway, you get the idea of the where you can search for different vegetables or, or for, for what, wherever. So it's been, I just, I'm so glad to be able to encourage you around a, a new gardening, warm season gardening season to come. Um, I hope we have abundant rainfall. We had a great year last year um, for growing warm season vegetables and, um, Hopefully this year will be like that too, um, it, and not be too hot and plenty of rain, so. Lisa, we do have a question from Linda. She's wondering, when is the best time to put out compost? Um, really any time. I, I would put it, I would, before you plant, if you have an open bed, um, I would put up at it before planting. You know, if you have a raised bed, you're going to plant with your tomatoes and peppers, you want to put that compost in now, unless your beds are already prepared from last fall. Anytime you harvest a plant um, or change it out, you know, sometimes we grow tomatoes through, say, August, they start to peter out. And so you want to try it with a fresh a fresh cutting, you can take a little shoot cutting and tip and grow new ones. Ruth had mentioned before we did started the program that her celebrity and early girl sort of had a second wind and as it went into the fall, we can do that with fresh plantings too, or new sowings of, I didn't actually talk about succession plantings of beans and squash and things like that, but that's a great technique if you have space for it. I, I mentioned that with cilantro every two weeks. Anytime you're going to plant again, add more compost or add more fertilizer and, and evaluate the look of your plants too. I'm often rather amazed at the size of some people's plants and realize, wow, they're really fertilizing a lot more than I am <laughs> to, to have these giant charred plants or whatever. And so anyway, so I, you can't add too much compost if you can get your hands on good stuff. Um, and Lisa, she sort of had a two-part question. It was compost oh, okay. and manure. And so would you put out manure at a different season than you would put out compost? No, I do it at the same, same, same kind of thing. Anytime you're doing change outs, preparing a bed, starting a fresh season. Um, if I'm gr growing it all year round, if I'm harvesting, you know, I'm harvesting warm season things as I'm before I'm sowing cool season things, I would be putting in compost or manure or both, and probably a handful of of uh, espoma to, for good measure too, because we're harvesting our vegetables. They're sucking up all those nutrients. Organic matter and compost and manure breaks down, so um, it. It needs to be replenished. Um, and I'm trying to think of, yeah. And you can always side dress with compost and manure. That just means you put it on either side of the plants as plants are growing, depending on how long or, or what kind of vegetable it is. Some need more nutrients than others. 
And in, in today's world, Google is your friend um, in terms of finding out more information or DuckDuckGo, whatever one you want to use. Um, finding out information about specific vegetables um, in our area. Our extension services have really good information. They tend to be still very conservative about planting times. Um, you can push them out more than we used to be able to. And um, we live in a great area. Reams Creek is a little bit conservative about planting time recommendations. Mm -hmm. We still stick with Mother's Day and even in Mad say Madison and Yancey, maybe uh, May 15th. Mm -hmm. And my boss this morning reminded me that uh, her uncle says, always be careful around the full moon in May, oh. which I checked to see that's May 26th this year. Oh my. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Just, oh goodness. Well, yeah, I see we've got some other, a couple of other comments and questions. Someone who has, her cover crop and it's currently drying and so that's all great so she can dig that cover crop in or compost it separately if you want um, yay to have homemade compost and worm castings use them in the same way you use other composts or manures as both amending the beds before you plant and side dressing along the way if you're lucky enough to have more worm com posting so those are all just wonderful amazing. and i'm sorry lisa i don't see those questions on my end so oh <laughs> they're in they the are. chat and mine yeah oops the chat does it, well maybe somehow i see them but that's that's good and um carmen peppers, carmen peppers. we had some and um i bought some and then i'm sure we'll be having more because that's a carmen great peppers variety. are favorite yeah, yeah. A great variety. There are lots of pepper, um, really wonderful hot peppers. And I actually I ran across one the other day that was a jalapeno pepper that had been bred not to be hot. And that would I think would be like that pizza pepper that would have a really wonderful thick wall. So yeah, that would be nice. Um, but there's so many good good plants. Um, I was to try growing, I'll, I'll mention a couple of unusual ones. Um, I grew, we were down in the Caribbean in the island of Dominica one year and I was looking for spinach and there was a gardener there who said she was selling spinach. And I was like, that doesn't look, I mean, I'm thinking that doesn't look like spinach for, to me, but she was, she was eating it. it. Turned out to be amaranth, it was red leafed amaranth, which is a warm season vegetable that it's obviously warm and rainy in Dominica. And um, I grew that a couple of years and it was really quite tasty. It was, a, um, it's, it's a beautiful plant. Um, and I mentioned that. If you happen, Malabar spinach is an, another warm season alternative to spinach, which we only grow as a cool season plant. I don't, it's a beautiful plant. I don't particularly like it, but some people really do enjoy it, uh, both fresh. It's very mucilaginous when cooked. Um, I don't believe I've ever grown New Zealand spinach. There are some heat tolerant varieties of lettuce. Um, I haven't grown them. I have my friend who, who was also in Garden Rider, she grew, had grown some that she was trialing. I don't, she never really told me if they were tasty or not. Um, you worry about bitterness in spinach, I mean, in lettuce in the heat. So Lisa, that, we used to grow um, on our farm in Madison County. We grew lettuce through the summer, uh -huh. but we did plant it on a very regular basis and it would definitely bolt at the- at So successfully. It would bolt. There wasn't any extending it the way you can like right now where you could pick around the outside. It would, from one day to the next, it might decide to bolt, but we did, um, definitely successfully. I mean, we were selling it wholesale, so we were growing yeah. quite a lot of it. And probably by getting ahead of, you know, growing it fast and quickly, it didn't have a chance to get bitter either. Right. So, and, and you may have been a little bit higher if, if you, elevation. Yeah, too. maybe 26. Yeah. Okay. Um, a question about hand watering and then soaker hoses. Um, 
I, I do hand water with a hose and a sprayer, but I don't have a huge, you know, huge area any to, to worry about. Um, I have used soaker hoses, especially when we did our children's vegetable garden at the botanical garden. They were a really great way to keep, keep ample moisture available to, to plants. Um, hot, dry hillside. Um, I would think so. The important thing is the, the soil needs to be moist, able to retain that moisture. If it's dry and compacted, you want to ha have it amended enough that that water can sink in and it's not heavy clay. But the soaker hoses worked really well at our children's vegetable garden. Um, and so that if you have the ability to do that uh, and access to water, I would I would go for it. So, but and I should mention too, uh, too that watering, even though we all love to go out and putter and water every day, you know, and enjoy admiring our vegetables, the general wisdom about this is you want to water really deeply more you know, on a once a week basis or once every three day basis to get that water deep and in, deep into the ground to the root system. So your plants get dig or plants extend their roots deep rather than creating shallow roots that then dry out and stress stress the plants. You may well have heat check if we happen to have some really hot days. I mentioned that already where the pollination doesn't occur normally because it's too hot that that's quite it can be fairly common with beans and some tomatoes um, but when it cools off they'll start producing again um, there was something i was going to mention about about that uh, too but uh, oh that sometimes the pollinators if you don't have squash bees around Another reason to have be an organic gardener or have flowers around is to encourage squash bees and bubble and uh, blueberry bees and other and bumblebees to pollinate your crops. I've had people that have had squash problems that essentially they had neighbors who just sprayed the heck out of their landscapes and so they didn't have any insects. So we want to, Ruth and I are on a bee city committee and we're all about promoting pollinators. So of all sorts. Yeah. <laughs> so go for organic gardening in your gardens. Anyway, if there are any other questions. Do we have any other questions? Raise your hand or, but in any case, um, I hope we, you all have a wonderful season in your gardens, but vegetable and flower and tree and shrub gardens. Oops, someone wants to know about the pollinator pocket. Um, that's a whole nother program, but um, what I use is tough native perennials and um, we have a very what, informal pocket border in the front of the house that's really um, quite attractive. I'll, let's see if I can. Maybe, um, maybe we can host. Lisa, later in the season with that workshop, I know it was people really enjoyed it last year. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a it actually you can see that I think I've still got the presentation on the sidebar of that of my blog that you can go and look at that and there's also a list of species, but I loved the pocket meadow and pollinator friendly meadow and we actually uh, I'll just mention down. Um, at the new Greenway in, in the River Arts District, um, uh, the Bee City Leadership Committee is part of a, a demonstration pollinator garden down there that I think will be a, a, good, a good spot to go and learn about some of these plants too. And actually at Reams Creek, and uh, you've got a nice pollinator border, uh, lots of great plants uh, available too to put in there. So. And I do think we'll be having a, um, a pollinator gardening talk. I think it will be on June 19th, but we haven't said anything about it in our newsletter yet. So yeah, okay, great. But that's upcoming. Yeah. But before, if, and just in case any other questions come up, I want to um, just take a second to thank each and every one of you for coming today and to especially thank Lisa Wagner 
for taking the time out of her morning to share all her knowledge and wisdom and her beautiful <laughs> garden beds with us. Thank you so much, Lisa. You're, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. <laughs> okay. So if there's no more questions, I guess we'll bid y'all goodbye and thanks again. <laughs> yeah, thank you. For goodness, coming. it's raining today too. It helps the soil. Bye-bye. I just landed my picture. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>